Lola, thanks so much for joining us for this conversation on climate change and women and girls. My pleasure. I want to start with just a really broad question. Why should we be thinking about climate change through this particular lens mm. of gender equality and women and girls? We don't have an option. If we take a gender lens, we know that we'll have a multiplier effect. We'll have an impact on both the social, political, and economic outcomes mm -hmm. of both individuals, institutions, and society writ large. Mm -hmm. If we do not, we will stay where we are mm -hmm. in sort of grappling with the many challenges that we face with the intersections uh, that climate change affects. What do you mean by that multiplier effect? Let's kind of unpack that. What does that mean in this case? It means if you invest in a girl, a dollar, and invest in both her financially, but also in her own development and education and enabling her to live and thrive, you will then result in inf impacting her family, her community, and the society within which she lives. That's the multiplier. So it's not just a dollar going into a girl, mm -hmm. it's actually a dollar going into an entire community. And why is that multiplier effect so strong for women and girls specifically? Mm -hmm. um, you know, people ask that a lot, mm -hmm. and it's funny, it's, Women and girls, the way that we think is holistic. Mm -hmm. It's not just about their individual outcomes and success. It's about the broader, bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And it's just as a natural way in which we in interact with the world mm -hmm. um, that makes an investment in girls and women just so much more valuable. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily valuable, but more impactful. I think I've heard you mention this before about just like why women's leadership can be yeah. so unique. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about that and then how that interfaces with the climate issue? Um, the way that women lead honestly tends to be um, with a bit of humility, mm. but with a thought about the future and a future orientation, sort of mm. the what's next. Um, we also take a thoughtful approach around not just you know the today and the who is around us right now, it's more about what's possible mm. for the future. So if we are in ignoring that voice and that perspective and that point of view, we're missing out on so much opportunity and, and vision. I want to come back to the solution side of things in a yeah. little bit, mm -hmm. but I want to talk a little bit about vulnerability and mm -hmm. why women and girls are so vulnerable to climate change. Um, just last week, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization had a study that showed that female-led households lose 8% more income from heat stress. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been many mm -hmm. studies over the years mm -hmm. that have showed this inequality in terms of how climate change is affecting yeah. women yeah. as opposed to others. I mean, can you just talk about why that is, why that vulnerability exists? Um, so think about access to water. Mm -hmm. um, and on the continent of Africa, women and girls actually are the ones who are responsible for collecting water. So think about how that affects their well-being. Mm -hmm. They have to walk miles and miles to collect that water to bring back to their families. That means that they aren't able to go to school. It's a choice. With climate change, access to water is even further and further away. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're actually, it results in the fact that women and girls are not engaging at all in society. Mm -hmm. They're trying to keep their families alive. Mm -hmm. So that choice is an unfair choice, number one. And secondly, it's a choice that it's not a choice. <laughs> um, and so we, are, we, we just really want to think more about how we can take a prevention approach, mm -hmm. how we can ensure that all families, not just the girls, are responsible for the well-being of their families, that it's a shared responsibility. What is the research in this area? I mean, it seems like we have not put enough resources into really understanding what all these linkages are. Is that correct? We haven't invested. Um, we haven't invested in women researchers, women scientists. Yeah. So there's that bias. Secondarily, we haven't invested in the research needed to really understand from community to community what the actual effects are on women and girls. So it's a two-pronged challenge. Um, so we, you know, people use the word sort of the pipeline. We need to start to invest earlier in science education in the sort of uh, from you know kindergarten on up mm. um, to ensure that we keep women and girls in in the field what would it look like if we had more equality in the sciences and if we had that more equality in research i mean what types of outcomes might we have yeah. what types of new results might we get i think the kinds of questions that mm. will be asked would be substantially different again this holistic intersectional sort of questioning of what is possible and what is right now would be different I also think that um, the connection between research and practice 
would be different. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of the way in which we do research would be different. Um, I, you know, what we find in the research sector is women and girls tend to be more in the qualitative research center. So collecting information in a new way, understanding a new way of knowing. Um, not everything we know needs a statistic behind it. Mm. Some things we just know. Um, I think some things we should acknowledge more. Um, again, the fact that if you invest in women and girls, the results, the data, the color of the world is different. Mm. Um, but that's really not happening. Um, and so we are sticking to old data, old facts that are not relevant right now, not relevant for the new world we live in. And isn't there a bit of a privileging of that quantitative data yes. over that qualitative yes. data? I mean, how does that affect women who are trying to engage yes. in this more qualitative research? Um, you know, it's undervalued to be factual. So you have women doing incredible qualitative research, and then you have sort of the field saying, well, that's not enough. That's not important enough. That's a feel-good science and not mm -hmm. a need science. Um, so that's, that's really unfortunate because that is actually the kind of science that is very useful for changing the narrative and changing the stories that we hear about when it comes to impacts on women and girls and what's possible. Mm -hmm. um, so we really need more, more of that sort of colorful storytelling um, to change the way in which we think about what's, what's possible. In your work, I mean, what are some examples that you've seen where you've really seen women leading the mm -hmm. way on climate solutions mm -hmm. in this sort of very unique mm -hmm. way? Um, we have one of our fellows in our network. Her name is Gloria Aguirre. She's a brilliant young leader. Mm -hmm. She's from Ghana, and she has an organization called the Ghana Youth Empowerment Movement. Mm -hmm. She works with young women and girls to engage them in what's possible food agriculture. Mm -hmm. But she brings such a light and energy mm -hmm. to the work. So it makes it something that women and girls feel like they have a space in and mm -hmm. hope in. Um, she's, again, when I talk about holistic thinking, she naturally wants to engage young people. Mm. She naturally thinks about their engagement in food ag agriculture and food access. And she's a natural convener. Mm. So we saw her show up at COP28 this year mm. by herself on her own, taking up space and bringing together all of these young people who hadn't been tapped or asked to be there, who hadn't been convened in, a, in a, an intentional way. And she did that. Mm. Um, that's the kind of leadership we need to invest in more of. Um, the other element that I think is exciting is this sort of multi-generational approach. Mm. So another leader that is incredible is Ndidi Nwelly. Mm. She is a food activist, an entrepreneur, a founder. Again, doing all of these things at the same time wearing all these hats, but again, passionate about youth leadership, youth engagement, and powerful with lots of access um, to influence conversations in rooms where women and girls typically aren't in. What are some of the pathways to increase the mm. access that activists like them have mm. to policy spaces, to places like mm. COP28? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the levers that we need to pull? Yeah. Where does the money need to flow? Yes, oh, good <laughs> question, I love this. Um, one, you have to invest in the, in the institutions that have already named that women and girls are essential in these conversations. Mm. Um, it's not always about financial resources, although that's key, invest in those organizations, invest in those leaders, invest in their full journey, not just a point in time. Give them flexible funds to solve problems the way that they know they should be solved. But it's also about access mm. um, and giving them, saying their names in rooms where they're not being said mm. and giving them th access to the keys to the castle. Mm. Um, oftentimes uh, we are overlooked and all it takes is one leader to say, come to this meeting, join me, sit down next to the table. What are your issues? What, what are your challenges? It doesn't take more time to do that. It means thinking more creatively about who needs to be in a room and what decisions you hope to make and what impact you want to have. Do you feel like you have seen that shifting? Like you have seen more doors opening? Um, hmm. <laughs> I think there's more visible conversation. There's more demand. Hmm. I think we're still too slow. Um, sadly, um, and what I love about being in the gender equity and justice space is there are so many women there and girls who are like, we are here, we love being in community, but we need our allies to engage in the conversation actively with intention so that the rooms really do change. And so that's the movement that we're, there's still a lot of work to do. Mm. 
So Project Drawdown, which is a group that looks at different climate actions yeah. and sort of ranks these different solutions, one of their top solutions for a long time has been, you know, educating women and girls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think they've gotten some pushback on that of saying, you know, well, what about, you know, the climate technology? Like, isn't that yeah. sort of more important? I'm uh, curious about what you think about that ranking. Do you think it's spot on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I run a group called the Global Innovators Group. And typically when people think about innovation or hear about it, they think tech. That's the way to go. That's where the dollars should be. And I think that is true. But there's so much we already know. And there's so much we need to unpack around implementation, which is super, it's not as sexy as the technology and the innovation yes. and the product, but it is the, once we sort of invest in the how and the why mm -hmm. things aren't working or why we can't scale certain technologies, mm -hmm. that's where the real answers are. And that's where we'll have the activation and the reach that we need. I love both sides, but mm -hmm. the side that we really need to start targeting is the how, the why, the technologies aren't spreading the way that we hope them to spread. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's 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 almost easier to create the technology yes. than it is to get it widespread, even if the costs are low, exactly. even if you have all of those components. Society, it takes a while yes. for us to change. I'm curious to ask a bit more about this vulnerability side of things and the way that women are uniquely vulnerable. I mean, what are some of the actions that we can take mm -hmm. to build up that resilience, particularly yeah. in developing countries where women don't have as many yeah. points of access and yeah. are responsible for yeah. more of these things like water? Yeah. Um, we work with another organization when we talk about fragility and vulnerability. It's women and women of color that are particularly vulnerable. vulnerable. And they are because the level of investment is never quite enough. It's never matching what a male leader would get. So mm -hmm. even if they are well financed at the beginning, they're not financed to their whole pathway. So that if anything happens, if there's a climate effect or a change in the economic system, mm -hmm. they're the first to fail. They're the first to go. They're the first ones out. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to ensure, like I said, that we're investing from the beginning to the end of their leadership journeys mm -hmm. and that we're giving them the power to resource others. Mm -hmm. um, that's why the intersectional thought is so critical because that's what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. The women and girls that I engage with are always thinking about who next, who beside me, who mm -hmm. should I name, mm -hmm. who, who is the legacy that I'm filling, mm -hmm. and are thinking about engaging them throughout their journeys. It's just a natural way of being. Um, and so that's, that's the fragility that they face. Yeah. Um, the second is, I just want to note that we have to invest in the systems that serve them. Mm. The health system, the primary health care system, the education system at the primary level. Thinking about not just investing in these entrepreneurs and brilliant leaders, but the systems that disable them from thriving mm. is key at the same time. You've mentioned a lot of talking about these really amazing women leaders from all over the world. I'm curious how you go about identifying those leaders. How do you find them? They're so easy to find, they're everywhere. I was walking down the street the other day and I found these two artists and food access entrepreneurs who were just wow. chatting in the street. Yeah. They're everywhere. Mm. Um, you know, we use a process of asking them who they think we should fund. It's a self new nominating process. It's not super difficult. If you ask a woman, what's a woman, another woman or girl who you think would value from this yeah. opportunity exercise, they can name them. Um, but then, you know, it's about being engaged in the world around us and mm. sort of watching where you see girls and women show up mm. and listening to them. Mm. Um, and then giving them an understanding of where they fit um, and where their ideas fit in the broader picture. Um, but the bottom line is they're everywhere. <laughs> you just have to look. You just have to look. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought up the healthcare side of things because I know you have a long healthcare background and I'm curious how you see the health issues overlapping with the yeah. climate issues. I know that there is a lot of overlap yes. there and a lot of sort of compounding damage that yes. can happen. Um, so yes, I'm a passionate health advocate and health systems thinker. Um, and that's the way that I see climate, is mm -hmm. we've seen um, health outcomes change significantly for women and girls because of the climate effect. This is why the urgency is there. Mm -hmm. um, it's both uh, physical, um, mental, mm -hmm. um, the global mental health crisis as a result of the climate effect is one that is incredibly scary, yeah. um, incredibly damaging, and it has, again, these multiplier impacts on economic out outcomes, on well-being, um, and in and, and different places in which they, women and girls show up. So it's, it's, it's important, but one of the concerns I have is that um, 
we think in such a siloed way. So there are billions of dollars going into the health care sector. And of course, there's increased interest in the intersection of that and climate. Yeah. But what we're seeing is a shift from investing in the health care system to investing in climate as though that's a choice that has to be made. <laughs> and in fact, it isn't a choice. It is, again, a applying these lenses to investing in the social fabric, mm. investing in systems. If you imply, apply all of these lenses at once, you're going to have much bigger wins. Mm -hmm. Has there been a project or some work that has done that overlap really well in your mind? I think in the advocacy space, mm. there are more examples of advocates who are bridging all those lenses of health, climate effects, and the youth engagement space because they are agnostic yeah. of a system. Um, that's where you see um, really great practices. That's why I mentioned Gloria and her work. Yeah. Um, that's, those are the best examples when you're work, looking at sort of youth leadership. Um, but there's still a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's still a long way to go, and we need the big systems, the big aid agencies to demand those lenses be applied when funding proposals, when funding projects, mm. and when investing in advocacy. I'm curious about the mental health side of things as well, because we know that women are sometimes facing a lot of repeated trauma from extreme weather yes. events, particularly women, for example, in Bangladesh or India or Pakistan, where yeah. they face such terrible flooding. I mean, can you talk about how women can be part of the solution there as well? Um, we're in an interesting year, 2024, where there are elections happening everywhere yeah. and big countries and small. I think if we use this opportunity to engage women in the civic process mm -hmm. where they see policies and practices that include them, um, that's where we'll have the greatest opportunity for change. Mm -hmm. So what I can say in this year and the next is if we give more pathways for women to vote, mm -hmm. to be placed intentionally in leadership positions, we will naturally see the changes and the intersections that we're demanding. Um, you know, the other point I'd add is, as we emerge from this pandemic, um, or I guess we're in it, wherever we are in this pandemic, yes. <laughs> ensuring that we're engaging girls in the new systems, the rebuilding of systems, mm -hmm. and in the leadership positions right now, mm -hmm. will have our greatest gains. And um, I look at countries like Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, as they recovered from the genocide, mm -hmm. there were intentionality placed in having X percentage of women in parliament, X percentage of women present in different spaces and in places. And it's resulted, you know, imperfect. We're imperfect everywhere, but resulted in, in just thriving communities, mm. a sense of collaborative practice when it comes to economic growth, mm. meaning that women are helping women, meaning that this mutual system of thinking of others, yeah. that's what's activating a new society. And I think if we see more of that intentionality, identifying women, giving them places to lead and show up and be confident and be heard, we'll have the results we, we dream of. I think for my last question, I'd just like to ask you, we could have people from all different walks of life mm -hmm. watching this, and it could be corporate leaders, it could be folks in education, folks in healthcare, folks in climate. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you say to people to get them started in mm -hmm. terms of thinking more actively about women in their organization, women that they might be educating, mm -hmm. any of those things? Well, um, it's Women's History Month, so we're being reminded um, in this month alone, but the work is every day. Yeah. So what I would encourage anyone in any sector is to look around the room. If there are no women there, you have a problem. And think about mentorship. Um, there's so much brilliance available. Use your time, your privilege, your power to identify a girl or an organization that needs visibility, amplification, and bring them into your work, bring them into your life. Show them pathways of opportunity and then invest, invest, invest. Dollars do matter. So put your dollars, if these are values of, that you share, the women and girls belong and are essential in decision making, invest. That's such a great call to action to end this conversation on. And thank you so much for joining me and for talking through all of the different issues that we face and how far we still need to go. Thank you, thank you so much.